Hello and welcome back. Up next here in this chapter, it's all about balancing equations and writing equations. We're going to talk about how to properly do both here in chapter 8. Part 1 of this lecture, it will be a two-part lecture. So let's get into it. Professor, start the lecture. All right, everybody, uh, welcome here. Up next here is chapter eight. Uh, as you can see on the screen, in addition to chapter eight, a little bit of some stuff from chapter 15, if you want to reference it. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about stuff from uh, 15.3 and I think section 15.6, but it kind of goes uh, with what we're gonna talk about here. Uh, so just a little bit of 15 along with eight, uh, just those kind of two sections from 15. Uh, and pretty much what we talk about here in this chapter eight is, again, what you pretty much need to know from chapter 15 in terms of uh, this exam and the material covered in this chapter. So in this chapter, it's all about chemical equations. Uh, it's also about chemical reactions. So we're going to start with uh, talking about chemical equations a little bit more. Uh, we've touched upon it in some earlier chapters. Uh, we're going to talk about balancing equations. Uh, we will then also talk about ways to classify reactions, uh, different types of reactions that we see. Uh, and we'll go through sort of a list of some different uh, types of reactions, as you'll see. And as we'll talk about uh, probably a number of times in this chapter, uh, there are many different ways that you could kind of classify uh, a reaction, uh, depending on sort of what you're looking at. So um, as we'll see, sometimes the same reaction, for example, uh, can be classified in three different ways. And we'll see maybe some examples of that. But first, we're going to really start with chemical equations. And a chemical equation is really a representation of a chemical reaction. And remember that a chemical reaction is really a chemical change. And when we do have a chemical change, uh, what we start with and what we end with are fundamentally different things. There has been some type of change that has occurred, and that is why it's referred to as a chemical change and a chemical reaction. And that is different than what we talked about when we were talking about physical changes and chemical changes. Uh, remember, a physical change uh, is a result of what we start with and what we end with is also uh, pretty much the same thing, so fundamentally the same thing. So. Most of the time, uh, we do use chemical equations to represent chemical reactions, as we'll also talk about here, probably a few slides down the road. Uh, we can also use chemical equations to represent physical sort of changes that occur. But first off, when we talk about a chemical reaction, how do we know uh, an actual reaction occurred? Uh, a lot of times there's some type of color change that occurs. Uh, so, you know, maybe you mix together a couple of solutions, and you mix them together, and then there's a some type of color change that happens. Uh, also, very commonly, you know, maybe you mix together a couple of solutions into maybe a new one, and maybe you make a solid, uh, some type of solid forms. A solid that forms is uh, sometimes referred to as a precipitate, and a precipitate is sometimes abbreviated as PPT in chemistry. So a lot of times you'll see people write PPT, and that's sort of the abbreviation for a precipitate, and it's basically a solid. And as we'll talk about <clears throat> probably a little bit later on here in this chapter, uh, not all solids are, uh, I guess the way to put it, like a rock-hard solid that just drops like a rock to the bottom. Uh, formation of a precipitate can be some type of observation, like you see it get cloudy, uh, gets mushy, some stuff floating around that wasn't there before. So sometimes people think when we talk about sort of precipitate or a solid being formed, it has to be this like rock hard solid that was just going to drop to the bottom. And it can just be something that gets really cloudy and stuff like that and stuff that wasn't there before. Other very common signs that uh, a chemical reaction has occurred is bubbles being formed. Bubbles is usually an indication you do some type of reaction and you see bubbles starting to form. Uh, usually those bubbles are gases basically, uh, that find their way to sort of escape. So usually any type of presence of bubbles and some type of reaction is usually a very good indication that you probably produce some type of gas as a result of that chemical reaction. Uh, also, other signs of chemical reactions 
uh, that may not be visual, uh, but uh, I guess a flame would be visible. Uh, you would definitely see it. But uh, heat, our energy being absorbed or uh, sort of given off in a reaction is something that you can sort of observe. Uh, and for example, very simply, for example, if you did a reaction, say, in a test tube, I'm going to draw a really bad hand there. And your hand, maybe it looks like a foot, I'm not really sure at this point, but uh, your hand is holding the test tube. And if your hand is holding the test tube here and your hand starts to feel really hot, I'll draw it red now, starts to feel really hot, uh, that means that the reaction is giving off energy. And that is why your hand is now starting to feel really, really warm, right? As it starts to absorb all the heat and energy that's coming off from the reaction in the test tube. Uh, alternatively to that, you could be holding on to that test tube since I use red for hot. Might as well go blue for cold. And maybe your hand starts to feel really, really cold, hence the blue. <clears throat> and that would indicate that perhaps the reaction is actually endothermic, going to absorb energy. The reason your hand feels cold is because it's sucking all the energy out of your hand. The result of that is your hand will then feel cold. And that's the opposite, obviously, when the reaction is giving off energy. When it gives off that energy, it's going to give it off to your hand and your hand will feel hot. Um, <clears throat> here's some examples where perhaps you'll do some of these in lab. Uh, this is actually magnesium burning and oxygen gives a very, very bright uh, color flash of light that you're not supposed to look directly at it, uh, but it's a chemical reaction. Actually, we'll end up making some uh, magnesium oxide, which if you do this reaction or see it done, maybe even lab, uh, you'll get this kind of white sort of powder residue that sort of comes off of it. And that's basically the uh, magnesium oxide. And that's the result of the magnesium metal plus the oxygen gas that's in the air coming together to make magnesium oxide. Um, and you'll sort of see it as this kind of whitish sort of powder. Here we have definitely a reaction going on here, maybe some zinc and some hydrochloric acid. I'm just going to take a guess at it. Uh, but what we do see here is what we just talked about. There are lots of bubbles. And again, all those bubbles pretty much indicate that some type of gas is being formed. Uh, for example, if this was zinc and a little hydrochloric acid, uh, what would happen is the zinc's actually coming in, kicking out the hydrogen. And as we talked about, when hydrogen gets kicked out or hydrogen is sort of by itself, the way that hydrogen comes is one of those diatomic molecules, right? So it comes through as H2, which is a gas. And that is the hydrogen gas, for example, that you would probably be seeing here as all of those bubbles. Uh, this is a, a precipitation sort of reaction being formed. Uh, we're mixing really two solutions here, a solution here, a solution here. The result of that is we are getting this yellow precipitate, probably led to iodide, just a guess. Uh, and that is a precipitate. So again, you can see, as I was mentioned earlier, uh, you know, it's sort of cloudy. It makes this yellow sort of precipitate, but, you know, it may not be like, you know, we sort of imagine solid like a rock or something like that. Again, that formation, that yellow that wasn't there previously is definitely a result of a chemical reaction taking place. Here's another one, obviously, pouring together, precipitate uh, being made. So let's talk a little bit about chemical equations officially here. I think we've touched upon it in previous chapters. Good talk. Let's go back and talk a little bit more about it. So a chemical change is uh, called a chemical reaction. And one way that we do represent it is with a chemical equation. Uh, so this is an example when hydrogen gas burns in air, uh, which contains oxygen to form water. Uh, this is an equation. And as we've talked about to the left-hand side of the arrow, uh, that's again going to be our reactants. And right-hand side here going to be our products. Remember, and we'll talk about this probably a number of times along the way, but uh, if you happen to be given something in words uh, and you need to write a chemical equation, it's really important that you first uh, get all the correct uh, formulas down. And very common places where people screw up as they're writing formulas for equations is when they deal with things like hydrogen gas. You know, they just write H or oxygen gas, they write O. And sometimes these guys are referred to as molecular 
hydrogen, which is a fancy way of saying uh, hydrogen gas, and also say molecular oxygen. So it's really important to remember that these are diatomic molecules. A few other ones that people mess up on nitrogen, right? Our halogens there are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodide. So a lot of times when we get into the sort of this chapter with equations and writing equations, uh, people really struggle with this. Uh, they kind of just use, you know, the one letter element. So you got to remember that these guys come as twos. And it's really critical for two things, as we'll talk about here. It's critical for obviously getting the correct formula down. And it's also really critical for the idea that when you go to balance this equation, which we're going to talk about here, uh, you're going to have a very hard time if you just use H, O, and nothing's going to balance correctly. So uh, sometimes people really struggle with that part. Uh, they just kind of refer back to, oh, it's just the symbol. But remember that these do come when they are uncombined by themselves as uh, these diatomic molecules. So when we look at this uh, equation, we could say a couple of ways uh, are in words. We could say that molecular hydrogen uh, reacts with molecular oxygen. So that's, again, what I was talking about earlier. That is sometimes how those two are referred to. Uh, sometimes people also just straight up say hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. To yield uh, is really what works for the arrow or what the arrow represents. So that's either to yield or to produce is sometimes referred to water. Uh, so that's sort of the word version of our equation that is written there. Now, when we look at this, there is something not so correct or kind of wrong uh, with the way this equation is written, uh, not in sort of the overall setup, but it's really this idea of the law of conservation of mass uh, tells us that we don't lose nor create any atoms or elements along the way. So nothing is sort of created nor destroyed. So there's really a conservation of elements in a chemical reaction. And that is because in a chemical reaction, all that is happening is all your bonds on your reactant side, all you're doing is breaking those bonds. And when you get to your product side, you are making those bonds. And Making and breaking bonds basically is really all you're doing when you have a chemical reaction. And what that involves is only electrons. So only electrons are involved in a chemical reaction. And as we remember, when we were talking about atomic number and mass number, protons, electrons, and neutrons, when we look at that top number, which is the atomic number, which is our number of protons, right? Every element has its own atomic number. So remember that because when a chemical reaction occurs, all that we're doing is playing with electrons. We are not touching the protons. That means whatever elements you start with on your reactant side, you should have the exact same elements on your product side. The only difference should be... Um, maybe where they end up. They will not be maybe in the same location or attached in the same sort of compound, uh, but we never touch the protons in a chemical reaction. We really don't touch anything inside the nucleus. And because of that, that means, for example, if you started with six carbons on the left-hand side of the arrow, you should end up with six carbons on the right-hand side of the arrow. And uh, again, they may just be in different things, but you should never lose any elements along the way. So with that in mind, when we look at this equation, we can make like a little table, reactants and products. And we have two elements, H and O. And on the left-hand side, we have two hydrogens. And again, that two goes there. On the right-hand side, we have two hydrogens, which goes there. On the left-hand side, we have two oxygens. Right-hand side, remember, if there is nothing written, it is assumed to be one. So we basically have one oxygen. So in this particular case, the problem with this equation is it is not a balanced equation. We have more oxygens on the left than we do on the right. And based on the law of conservation of mass and what we were just talking about, uh, you cannot have that situation occur. 
Uh, so that is a problem. So we do have to fix this problem by taking with that equation, which is sometimes referred to as the unbalanced equation, and we really need to balance the equation. So one really important thing about balancing equations, and we're going to talk about it in just a sec, is uh, we only change coefficients when we balance equations. So coefficients are those numbers that come in front of a formula in a chemical reaction. We never, ever change the subscripts. No, don't do that. Uh, we never put a big number in between. Don't do that either. Uh, this is the only thing that we should change. So as we saw there, we obviously have uh, two oxygens on the left, only one on the right. So we could fix it by putting a two right about there. And when we do that, uh, if we kind of make our little table we had there on the previous slide again, uh, we have hydrogen and oxygen. Again, on the left-hand side, we had our two hydrogen and our two oxygens. Uh, Right-hand side, before we began, we had two and one. Now with the two that I put there in front of the water, this coefficient actually gets distributed to everybody that is behind it. Uh, so that would technically now give me four hydrogens on the left and two times, once again, nothing written is one. Uh, would give me two. So I did now fix the oxygen, uh, but once again, uh, our hydrogens are now messed up. So we could actually fix that by now going to the hydrogen and putting a two in front of there. And once again, that two gets distributed uh, to everything behind it. So that's gonna give us four hydrogens, still our two oxygens. And obviously we didn't do anything over here. So that's still the same. Now we are good. We now have a balanced equation. We basically started with four hydrogens. We ended with four hydrogens. We started with two oxygens. We ended with two oxygens. This is a balanced equation. Every single equation you ever use in chemistry should be balanced. So if you see coefficients, it probably balanced, but you should take a moment to check it to just to make sure it is balanced uh, before you continue on with your calculation. Uh, if you see an equation given to you or come across an equation that's given to you, then you definitely see no coefficients written there, kind of like our first uh, little example there. Uh, you should take a pretty hard look at it and make sure it may be balanced, but double check that it is balanced. So uh, I can't tell you enough or stress enough that pretty much everything you do in chemistry uh, that involves an equation, nothing works correctly if the equation is not balanced. So that's almost like the first thing you always want to do is make sure it's balanced. Probably the very first thing you want to do is make sure you get the right equation down. Secondly, you want to make sure that it is balanced before you try to use it with anything. So as we see there, by putting our coefficients in the proper location, uh, we get our balanced equation. And once again, on the left-hand side, as we've been talking about, uh, we have reactants. Uh, which is our starting material. So these are our starting materials in this reaction. This is our products, which are our uh, substances that are formed as a result of the chemical reaction. It's always reactants that go to products. <clears throat> Here's an example, obviously a lot going on here. We got fumes happening. Uh, so we got sparks as well. So this is when aluminum foil is dropped into some liquid bromium. Uh, definitely many signs of a chemical reaction sort of occurring. Now, when we look at chemical equations, and we probably will use this relationship in the next chapter, I think is where it's coming up. Uh, but there are some ways that we can look at this equation and uh, figure out what's going on. And it's based a lot of times on the coefficients. So that's a two. Once again, there's nothing written here in terms of the coefficient. So that does mean one. Uh, we do have a coefficient of two here. Uh, we can say that that's two molecules of H2 react with one molecule of O2 to form two molecules of H2O. The relationship that we use a lot and is what we use and was referred to as stoichiometry, which is sort of the basis of the next chapter, uh, is what is sometimes referred to as the mole to mole relationship. And we could say that those coefficients means moles of each of those things. So there are two moles of hydrogen 
react with one mole of oxygen gives us two moles of h2o this is our conservation of mass because we basically although they are in different sort of compounds on our molecules on each side of the equation uh, we have the same number of hydrogens on the left and the same number of hydrogens on the right. And since the hydrogen weighs 1.008 grams, uh, we have the same mass of hydrogen on the left and right. And same thing with oxygen. Since oxygen is 16 grams per mole, uh, we have the same 16 grams on the left as we do on the right. In this case, that's the same 32 grams on the left as we do on the right, since there's two on each of them. So we definitely will see this relationship coming up a little bit later on in the next chapter. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Now, there's a lot of other information that we can see when we do look at an equation. And here are some uh, representations of that. Uh, a lot of times the state of substances are given in parentheses next to it. So S is solid. Uh, L is liquid. G is gas. Uh, we also will see, I think it's coming up on the next slide, but I'll just kind of preview it. We'll also see a symbol that's sometimes referred to as AQ, which is aqueous. Aqueous is a water environment. So those are four common sort of states of substances that we come across. And that's what we see here. So we got some gases. Uh, we got some solids, gases, and liquids actually in that particular equation. As I mentioned before, most of the time chemical equations are used to represent chemical reactions or chemical changes that occur, but we could actually use a chemical equation to actually represent a physical process that's happening. Uh, so for example, here we have water in the liquid state going to water in the solid state. So it's pretty much water on both sides of the arrow. It's our reactants and products. Uh, one's in the liquid and one is in the solid. So that's essentially ice and liquid water, right? And that change is actually a physical change that's occurring. Uh, so we can use this equation to represent that. Uh, what tells us it's a, the difference between the two is actually including the state. Uh, obviously, if you didn't include the state on the left and right-hand side, you'd have really no idea what's going on. Uh, same thing here. Uh, that's our water in the liquid state going to gas state of water. Uh, which is essentially steam, right? So that's what happens at the boiling point uh, when it starts to boil and gives off all those fumes, uh, which is really the steam that's coming off as you boil water. Now, a couple other things that sometimes you'll see is sometimes up on the arrow itself, uh, things are written. Uh, and for example, water is written here and water is written on top of the arrow to imply that we're dissolving the solid sodium chloride to actually make a sodium chloride solution. So we spoke about sort of aqueous and liquid a second ago, and sometimes people wonder, you know, what is the difference? They are both sort of in the liquid state, if you will. So there is actually a difference between a liquid and something that's aqueous. Aqueous is really a solution. And that is really a homogeneous mixture. If you remember, a homogeneous mixture means everything dissolves, everything looks the same throughout. And a liquid is really just a pure substance by itself. So what do I mean by that? If I had water, for example, we'll use this example that we got on the page here. Water by itself is a pure substance, which is a liquid. Now, if I take water like we're doing here in this reaction or equation, and I take some solid sodium chloride, which is an ionic compound, uh, the sodium chloride or salt will dissolve in the water. And when they dissolve in the water, they will make a sodium chloride solution that's actually aqueous. And that is a solution which is really a mixture. Remember, a mixture is two or more substances together. In this case, it's the water and the sodium chloride. So water by itself, though, just plain old water by itself is a pure liquid, is not aqueous because it's only water by itself. So uh, something that has the sort of designation of L is a pure substance. That's only that thing in there. Something that has the AQ is really a solution or something that's aqueous. And that's usually made by dissolving something 
in something else. Like in this case, dissolving some solid sodium chloride in some liquid water. Uh, and that's what's sort of known as that. A solution, as we'll talk about in a later chapter, is basically made up of a solute and a solvent. And in our example here, the water is the solvent, and that's usually the larger part of the solution. And the solute's the smaller part of the solution. And it would be our sodium chloride in this case, it would be our solute. So those two things together make a solution, and that's why they're a mixture. Again, two or more things together. Uh, other things that we commonly will see sometimes on the arrow, uh, we will see maybe the little delta symbol. Uh, that usually means heat is being added. Uh, we sometimes will see catalyst written up here. And it could be something like uh, H plus if it's an acid catalyst. It could be something like a metal, like platinum maybe, or something written up there. So what is a catalyst? A, a catalyst is not a reactant. It's uh, not a product either. And a catalyst actually uh, does not get used up. in the reaction. What a catalyst typically is there for is to make the reaction occur faster. So in most cases, uh, it basically makes the reaction occur faster. We'll talk a little bit about probably a little later on in this chapter, but uh, one way it's able to do that is it sort of finds a more efficient alternative pathway uh, for that reaction to take place and thus it allows it to sort of speed up the reaction. All right, so let's talk about the importance of balance equation and a couple of approaches of how to balance equations. And, you know, there's sort of many ways that sometimes people will balance equations or try to balance equations. Um, and we're talking about these two approaches here, but a lot of times people will frankly kind of use a uh, trial by error, kind of put some numbers down. There are some things that you want to think about. So first off, you want to make sure that the number one thing here is sometimes you are given everybody in terms of words. So you're sort of given the reaction in words, or maybe you're given half the equation. Uh, you got maybe the reactants and you need to predict uh, what the formula of the products are on the other side. Uh, the very first thing that you want to always make sure that you do is this, and it's sometimes easier said than done because people oftentimes try sometimes to do this thing together. And what I'm talking about is uh, you want to make sure that before you even think about the balancing part of the equation, uh, what you really want to do is make sure that you get all the correct formulas down first. Uh, again, nothing's going to work right if you don't have the correct formulas. And very often where people run into error is they try to write the equation and the formulas and try to balance it at the same time. So that is something that you don't want to mix together. You want to definitely do them separate and you want to do it in this order Regardless of the balancing part, you want to first get all the correct formulas down first and then go back and balance. So that's really, really important to keep in mind and a very common error that a lot of people make. You want to begin balancing the equation. Sometimes people will start with the most complicated molecule. I personally kind of look at what seems to be the easiest to balance, and that's a good approach as well. We want to make sure, as we've been talking about, that we only use coefficients. So once again, we could only change the number that comes in front of something. Only this number gets changed. Never this number, as we talked about earlier. Once again, never put big numbers in between or anything like that. Only this guy right there is what should get changed. You want to continue to put coefficients down until you basically have the same number of elements on both sides of the equation. And what will very commonly happen is as you go to balance an equation, you'll fix something by putting a coefficient and then you'll kind of screw up something else. So a lot of times you kind of go back and forth 
uh, one side, next side. Eventually, though, everything should fall into place if it's all done correctly. There are two things that you want to make sure of when you're done balancing the equation. The first thing is you have exactly the same number of elements on each side of the arrow. Secondly, they do need to be the simplest set of whole numbers. So what do I mean by that? So let's just say, for example, you have this equation and you use these coefficients, 2a plus 4b uh, gives you 6c. And we'll just say this is a balanced equation at this point. So although it's a balanced equation, when you look at the coefficients, you actually can reduce all these coefficients down still and still get whole numbers. So uh, you tr divide everybody by two here, and that would give you a plus two B gives you three C, and that would be the properly balanced equation. And this does happen more often than you may think. You know, there's sometimes people will see larger numbers and absolutely, you know, uh, it's balanced. You have the same number of elements on each side, but you could still reduce it down. So if you find yourself balance the equation and you could still reduce down all the coefficients, not just some of them, but all the coefficients and still have whole numbers, you need to do that. Otherwise, it's not properly balanced. So that's what it means by simplest set of whole numbers. Uh, you want to make sure you get that whole number, lowest set. Uh, you can't reduce it down anymore and still have all number. Here's an alternative approach. Again, kind of a similar idea. Uh, you can look for uh, things that appear only once in each side, which is sort of what I do. Um, look for elements that appear one side on each and unequal numbers and then balance them and then obviously check them. So let's take a look at some here and just kind of go through some and sort of see uh, what we should be doing. So for example here, if we have this equation, we'll do this one here together first. Uh, the first thing that I want to do, I'm going to actually rewrite this to have a little bit more room to put some numbers in there. Okay, we got a little bit of that, a little bit of that, and a little bit of that. I would highly recommend, and a lot of times it's very helpful to make sort of a table. And a table is really helpful because it really sort of gives you an idea where you want to start what you should maybe work with, what things are balanced, what things are not balanced. So I'm just going to make a nice little table here of my reactants and products. I'm just going to list the elements. So I have a nitrogen, an oxygen, and a hydrogen. So in this case, I'm going to count up what I got going on on the left. Uh, so here, obviously, uh, there's only one nitrogen. On the right-hand side, there are two nitrogens. Left-hand side, it looks like uh, one oxygen there. Right-hand side, also one oxygen. Remember, if nothing's written, it's one. Looks like I got two hydrogens there. And two hydrogens there. So if I look at my table, the nice thing about this is I could clearly see everything is balanced except for nitrogen. So that clearly seems to be the good place to start. So to fix the nitrogen, remember, we could only change the coefficients. So we're going to go with a two here. And now remember that this two actually gets distributed to everybody that comes behind it. So that would now give me two nitrogens on the left. It would then give me two oxygens on the left. And I would still have two hydrogens on the left-hand side. The right-hand side here, I didn't put anything down or change anything. So it's still the same. So this is also a very common thing that occurs. We obviously fixed the nitrogen, but kind of screwed up the oxygen, which is again, very common, not a problem. We can now easily fix that by going to the right hand side here. And we're going to put a two in front of our oxygen, which is actually in the water there on the right hand side. Once again, this is going to give us two nitrogen still. This two again gets distributed to each of the things behind it. So that's going to give us two oxygens and two times two is four hydrogens. So we're getting a lot closer. We have now balanced out the nitrogens. We have now fixed our oxygens. That leaves us hydrogen that's left. And now hopefully you could very easily see 
all I have to do is come over here and put a two there. And once again, on the left-hand side here, two times one is two. Uh, two times one is two. And two times two is four. This equation is now balanced at this point. So as you can see there, you know, you got to kind of fix one thing, get rid of some of these things here so we can kind of see the results. Uh, so you can put in a, a coefficient out there, kind of fix one thing, and then come back and fix something else, kind of back and forth, and eventually everything should uh, come into place. Much like everything else in chemistry, you do not need to put a one there, but a reminder that if there's nothing written in the front, uh, it is a one in this case. Uh, so that, again, is where we get our nitrogen. All right, so I tried one. Seems like now maybe it's your turn to try one. So why don't you give this one a go here. So take a moment or two and see what you come up with. Balance this equation. Okay, uh, so let's take a look and see how you're doing. So once again, we're going to start with a nice table. I rewrote the equation. So let's have a little bit more room to put those coefficients in. Uh, we're going to label our elements. So we got carbon, a little hydrogen, and a little oxygen action. So here we got, uh, let's take a count. We got three carbons there. Uh, we got only one carbon there. Hydrogen, we have eight on the left. Hydrogen over here, we have two. Oxygen on the left, we have two. And oxygen on the right here, a reminder here, we have two. And we do not want to forget about this guy. So that is number three there. So we do have to count all the elements, even if they're not in the same compound or species or substance. Uh, do you want the total on each side? So in this case, we don't got a lot to work with. Uh, there's really nothing that is balanced. So personally for me, I would look at this and go, well, carbon seems pretty easy to fix. I got three on the left and only one on the right. So why not put a three there? When I do that, once again, that is going to get distributed to everybody behind it. And that's going to give me three carbons. I still have uh, two hydrogens there. And now for oxygen, I got uh, three times two, which is six. And once again, I still have one more over here, which actually gets me to seven if my math is not too bad there. So now I have fixed the carbon. I still have hydrogen, oxygen that need some help. Where am I going to go next? So this is a situation where when I look at it, I can see that hydrogen is going to be pretty easy to fix because frankly, it is only in one thing on each side. Why would I maybe not start with oxygen? Well, when I look at oxygen, there's there's oxygens and two things over there and one thing over there. So it's in a lot of things. So because it's in multiple places, oxygen, I'm going to actually kind of leave that to the end to try to fix it. And I'm going to start with hydrogen here because, again, it's only in one spot. So to fix the hydrogen very easily, I'm going to lay me up a four right about there. Uh, once again here, this three is still here, so it gets distributed. So that is three carbons. Uh, hydrogen's four times two, which is eight. Now for oxygens, we still have our three times two, which is six, but now we have a four here. So that's going to be four times one, which now becomes a four. So that is six and four now becomes 10 in this case. Now by saving that oxygen, I can fix it easily by going back to the left here. I clearly don't want to change any of the coefficients on the right because that's going to change everything else. And we can easily fix it by putting ourselves a five right about there. And that gives us, again, uh, three carbons, eight hydrogens, and five times two or two times five, whichever way we want to go, is 10 oxygens. Now we are balanced. And once again, here, I'll get rid of uh, some of these extra scribbles here. You can kind of see it. And now we have the balance equation. So, uh, I personally like to take the approach as I just did there, kind of the easiest thing to fix, go first, and then um, save it things that are in multiple places like the oxygen was here to the end. All right, let's continue on through here. Try a few more just to make sure our balancing skills are up to date. This is one where we actually have uh, words. 
So remember when you have words, you want to first write the formulas correctly and then balance equations. So take a few moments and see what you come up with here. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so this is a proper formula. So I see some prefixes. So that's a type three. So di is two, boron is B. Tri is three, oxide is oxygen. So that's a B2O3, reacts with water, which is our friend H2O. To form boric acid, which they gave you, which is BOH3. So once again here, I'm not concerned about the balancing. I just want to get all the proper formulas down first. Now that I have done that, I could roll into my balancing part of it. And to balance it, I'm again, going to make a table. So on the reactant side, product side, we got a BOH here. Uh, so once again here, uh, we got a two there for boron. We have a one there. For oxygen, we have three here. And once again, we have one more there. So that's a total of four. Now we have something with parentheses here and we do have a number on the outside. So this number does get distributed to everybody in the parentheses. So this three goes to here. This three also goes to here. That means for oxygen, we actually have three. And for hydrogen, we have two on the left. We would also distribute that three and we have three here on the left. So if you do have parentheses with a little number on the bottom, you do have to kind of distribute that number into the parentheses uh, to everybody that is there. So uh, here, see that? not a lot to work with. So what seems very easy here is let's just start with the boron. And since the boron's an only one thing over here, we're going to put a two here. So what does that do? Well, the two goes to this guy. The two also goes to this guy and the two goes to that guy. Don't forget, we still have the three there as well coming into the parentheses. So that's going to give us two for the boron. Now what we have here is, I'll just kind of put it up here. We put it two. We remember when we look at the oxygens, we have this three times one, which is three. Then we actually need to multiply it by two, which will actually give us six in terms of our oxygen the hydrogen actually will come out the same. You're asking me maybe, how could that be? How is the count? So here, what I'm going to do is this. What I just wrote here is basically one of the BOH3, but we put a two in front of it, which means we have two of them. So we basically have this, and I'm just gonna do the element. Now we can add up everything, right? As we can see, we have one boron and two. So that is where that came from. We now have, if we count up our oxygens, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So that is where that came from. And we count up our hydrogens, one, two, three, uh, four, five, and six. So that is basically what, if you just kind of drew out all the parts that are there, uh, when we do have parentheses, that's where we get all those numbers from. All right, so I'm just going to kind of clean up some of my scribble here, make it maybe a little bit easier to see everything going on. Maybe get rid of that too and those guys as well. Let's get rid of that. Okay, so now that we have our two there, clearly we don't want to fix, do anything on the right hand side at this point because uh, if we do, we're going to screw up everything on the right because they're all connected, obviously. So the next easiest thing really to fix here is again going to be the hydrogen. So why am I again picking the hydrogen? I am picking the hydrogen because when I look at hydrogen, it's on this side in one thing and it's on this side in one thing. When I look at the oxygen, it's in one thing on this side, but oxygen's in multiple things on the other side, which means it's gonna mess up a lot of things. So we're gonna start with the hydrogen and see how we do. So to fix the hydrogen on the left, I got six on the right. I need six on the left, I already got two, that's going to be a three we're going to put there. So now we have uh, two borons. Oxygen, we have three here. And this guy once again gets distributed. So that is three there and three there, which is six oxygen. And for hydrogen, three times two is also six. 
And this is also what happens in a lot of cases is I was shooting to fix hydrogen, but by fixing hydrogen in this example, it also fixed oxygen, which again is a very common thing that occurs. At some point, if you have the proper equation written and you're balancing it with coefficients, at some point, pretty much everything should fall into place. And if you find yourself there forever and things don't seem like it's going to ever balance, probably what you're dealing with is a situation where you do not have the right formula down somewhere or maybe multiple wrong formulas, but eventually everything should sort of fall into place. So once again here, that looks like our balanced equation. We'll get rid of some of the extra scribble here just so we can see where we ended up with there. That way, that way, and that way. All right, so let's take a look at another one here as we become balancing professionals, maybe. All right, here we go. A little NH3 plus some O2, a little NO and H2O. You know what to do. Do a little balancing there and see what you come up with. Yeah, uh, let's take a look, see how you're doing. Hopefully you got somewhere on this one. Maybe you stopped at somewhere along the way and figured maybe the best idea is to go to the next problem. It might be. Let's see. All right. So I rerouted here and uh, just give me a little bit more room. I'm going to take the same approach here. going to make a little table action here. A little nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen happening. Uh, so once again, on the left there, we got one nitrogen. On the right, we got one nitrogen. Left, we got three hydrogens. Right, we have two hydrogens. Left, we have two oxygens. Right, we have an oxygen and one there. That looks like a two. So it doesn't look too bad here. Uh, nitrogen looks balanced. Uh, hydrogen looks ba does not look balanced. Oxygen does look balanced. So in this case, uh, we have three hydrogens on the left, two on the right. So we do actually put a number on both sides of the arrow here. So common number between three and two is six. And by the way, you get that by just multiplying them together. Three times two is six. So to make my hydrogen on the left there a six, I need to put a two. Make my hydrogen on the right there a six, I need to put a three. So let's see what this does to our accounting. Once again, this two going to get distributed. So we have uh, two nitrogens, six hydrogens, and two oxygens. On the right-hand side, uh, one nitrogen still. Hydrogen, uh, this three gets distributed as well, so that's going to be six. And oxygen, we have one there, and we also have three there. So that is a total of four in this case. All right, so we fixed the hydrogen and managed to screw up everything else. Oh, all right, it happens. So what's the easiest thing to fix here? Once again, I'm going to go with the nitrogen for the same reasoning that we talked about previously. Nitrogen's in just one spot on each side of the arrow. Oxygen's in a lot of places all over the place. So I'm going to save oxygen for the end. So to fix my nitrogen very easily, we're going to put a two right about there. And that's going to get distributed again to everybody behind it. So that's going to give me a two nitrogens. Hydrogen is still going to be six, as we have right here. And now for oxygen, where are we at? So we got uh, two oxygens from that. And now we also have still three oxygens there. So that's going to actually give me five oxygens in this case. Uh, so now we're at a situation where maybe it stopped and again was thinking, hmm, maybe we just go to the next problem, which maybe still not the worst idea here. But let's see if we could try to figure out how we could fix this. So here's the situation we're at. We clearly do not want to touch anything on this side because we've already put our numbers there. So we're really focused in and really the only place we have a spot for a number is actually right about here. So that is what we need to sort of concentrate on uh, to try to fix this. So how can we fix this? Well, what we have on the right hand side in terms of what we have on the right hand side here in, in terms of oxygen is five. And on the left-hand side there, we have two. So we essentially need to make our two into a five. So how can we do that? Well, we could use what is referred to as a fraction, five over two, for example. 
Now, five over two, let's see if that helps us. This gives us now on the left two nitrogens. Uh, gives us two times three is six hydrogens. And now when I take five over two and times it by two, which is this guy being times by the two, uh, the twos cancel, and that gives me five. That is a balanced equation. Now, is that a properly balanced equation? So although I did put a happy face, you're probably hopefully putting in an unhappy face because it cannot be a fraction, right? So this is a really good example that illustrates the idea that you could absolutely use a fraction to balance an equation, uh, but you can't leave it. So remember that when you're done balancing your equation, you have to have all whole numbers, the simplest set of whole numbers. But you can absolutely use a fraction like we did here to balance it. You just need to do one additional step. And that additional step is you need to get rid of the fraction. So how do we get rid of a fraction? Well, I think that bottom number, they still call a denominator, I hope. We're going to multiply everybody by the denominator, not just a fraction, but everybody in there. And that's going to give us uh, 4 and H3. That's going to give us 5 halves times 2, which is 502. Going to give us 4 NO. And lastly, 6 H2O. Now, if I did not screw this up and transpose any numbers, we actually should still be balanced. And we are still all whole numbers. So let's take a look here in our final equation. We now have four nitrogens. Four times three is 12 hydrogens. And five times two is 10 oxygens. I'll get rid of my unhappy face and we'll go with my happy face. On the right hand side here, we have four nitrogens. So that matches. Check. Uh, we have 12 hydrogens. So that matches. Check. And now we have four oxygens there and six oxygens there, which is 10. And that is a winner. Uh, so you absolutely could use a fraction to balance it. And this is a common place where it happens, where you have an element in multiple places on one side, and you have the diatomic version of the element on the other side. So it's a very common sort of situation where you could use it. Now, you may also be asking, how do I know what fraction I should choose? The way that you choose your fraction is pretty simple. So I'm just going to put the O2 that was there. So if you remember, we needed a 5 there. So the top number is always the number you need. So if you remember when we were balancing, we needed a 5. The bottom number should always match that number. So that's a very easy way to pick the right fraction. If you go, okay, I need a 6 or a 9. Top number nine, bottom number two, if they it's like something like O2. So top number, what you need, bottom number should match kind of the diatomic subscript, which probably will be two in most cases. And that's how you can pick the right fraction. You just got to clear it. So yes to fractions, okay to use. No to fractions to leave them. You got to clear them. Otherwise, it is incorrectly balanced. So make sure that you do clear them. All right. So that was from funness and balancing. So let's take a look at a couple of other sort of situations here uh, with balancing. <clears throat> I don't remember where I went. There we go. All right. So let's take a look at this one here. And why don't you take a second and try to balance these two equations and see what you come up? Okay. Uh, let's take a look. All right. So here's the deal on these. And we're going to take a kind of slightly different approach than what we were doing with our previous examples. And the reason for that is in this particular case, hopefully you could recognize we have some polyatomic ions. So you remember our polyatomic ions, sulfate, nitrate, those type of things. So we actually have sulfate on each side. We also have some nitrates on each side. Now, could you make a table like we did before and go element by element? You can. It just might be a little bit more room for error if you kind of take that approach because... There's a lot of parentheses, a lot of multiplying in, a lot of multiplying out. So sometimes if you see equations like this where you could recognize polyatomic ions on both sides of the arrow, it's often easier to just kind of keep the polyatomic ions together 
and like balance them as like units. So what do I mean by that? For example, if I look at the sulfate here, I got like two sulfates on this side. I got one sulfate on this side. If I look at the nitrate, I got two nitrates on this side. I got four nitrates on this side. So in this case, you could actually start with either one. So for example, I'm going to start with the, we'll do the nitrate. Why not? So I'm going to go with the nitrate and go, okay, I got two on this side. And again, that's from the two that's outside the parentheses. And I have four on this side. So to fix my nitrates, I need four on the left. So I'm going to put a two in front. What does that do? That gives me now two times two here, which gives me four nitrates. When you do this method, after I fix the nitrate, it also affects whatever is attached to the nitrate. So that's magnesium. And that's where I should go next. So now I have two magnesiums and I only have one magnesium here. So to fix that, I'm going to put a two. That now fixes the magnesium. But that two also now goes to my sulfate, which is two that I need. So I'm going to go to the left-hand side and looky there. It's a two. So that's perfect. And I also have one nickel and one nickel. So by keeping those polyatomic ions together, I could very quickly balance this equation by balancing the polyatomic ions on both sides. And very commonly, as we see here, everything will fall into place. Now, let's just say, for example, we didn't start with the, uh, we started with the nitrate in this case, but we in this case, let's say we started with the, try to erase everything here, not erase the equation. Uh, do that, do that, do that, and that. All right, so let's just try the opposite way. And let's just say that we uh, decided we want to start with the sulfates. Uh, I think that's different than what we started with. So we have two sulfates there, one there. So to fix that, I'm going to put a two there. That two goes for my sulfate, also goes for my magnesium. And that's where I should go next. So then I'm going to put a two here. That goes for two magnesiums and uh, now four nitrates. And that's four nitrates in my one. Uh, nickel. So you're good. Won't always work. Maybe you have to pick one polyatomic ion versus the other, but a lot of times if you keep them together, it works much, much better. So let's take a look here. We got carbonate here and we have carbonate here. We have sulfite and also sulfite here. So once again, you can kind of choose which one you want to start with. So in this case, I'm going to, I don't know, I'm going to start with the uh, sulfite. So I have one here. And I have three here. So to fix that, I'm going to put a three here. That's going to give me three sulfites. Also now will give me six sodium. And that's where I should go next. So over here, I have only two sodium, which means I need a three here. That now gives me six sodiums. And also now gives me three carbonates, which is exactly what I need here. And now I'm balanced. So you can see how quickly you can balance these. Much faster way to do it when you have polyatomic ions. Clearly on the previous ones, we didn't really have polyatomic ions, so not really a benefit to try to do anything like that, but definitely with polyatomic ions, there's a lot less kind of uh, multiplying in element by element and kind of keeping those guys together makes it a little bit easier. All right, so I tr went through these. Why don't you try these two here and maybe try that method and see what you come up with. All right, let's take a look. All right, so on this one, uh, we actually still have one polyatomic ion on both sides, which is sulfate. That's actually the only one we have. So we could still try the same approach. Uh, I got three here, and I only got one here of the sulfates. So to fix that, I'm going to put a three in front. That's going to give me three sulfates. Once again, the next place I should go is whatever is attached to the sulfate, which is calcium. So that's three on the right, only one here on the left. So to fix that, it's going to put a three there. Remember that three now also goes to the chloride. And that's going to be three times two is six. So over here, I only have three. So I need a two here. That's going to give me six chlorides and two iron, uh, which is actually what I need there. So now we are balanced. So even if you only have one polyatomic ion like we do here, method still works pretty well. And the idea there is fix the first polyatomic ion, whatever is attached to it, that's where you go next. And you kind of keep following wherever you go next is where you should kind of fix the coefficients. All right, let's take a look at the next one here. We've got a couple of polyatomic ions in this one. We've got a little nitrate action on both sides, a little phosphate happening here. So once again, we could choose whichever one that we want to do. 
So for example here, let's just say you chose nitrate. We have two over here and one over here. So to fix out, we wanna go with two. So that gives us a two for the nitrate. And next place we should go is to the copper, which is two. And now we see we have a little problem. So sometimes it doesn't work perfectly if you choose one polyatomic ion versus the other. Uh, so we could fix that. We could do a couple of things, but maybe the easiest thing would be just to erase. And since nitrate didn't seem to give us a pretty good pathway to where we wanted to go, why don't we then start with the phosphate here? So uh, we have one phosphate here and two here. So to fix that, we're going to go a two here. That gives me two phosphates. Uh, two times three is six for the copper. And that's where we should go now. We're doing better. And that gives me six coppers and six nitrates. To finish it out, we need a three there, giving us six nitrates and three bariums. And now we're balanced. So again, you might have to go back. Sometimes it does happen that way, but you could easily fix it. Uh, by the way, we had like a two here, I think, before. And it didn't work, but if you just multiply two times three, you know, you actually needed six and you could kind of fix the error really quick or just start again like we did there and it will work out. All right, one last one here to solidify our balancing equations. Mastery of these skills, I suppose, is a good way to do it. One last one here, a little C4H10O2, making CO2 and water. I'm sure you know what to do at this point. Balance it up and see what you come up with. All righty, let's take a look at this one. Hope we give it a shot. Hopefully you got some coefficients on there. So in this case, uh, we're back to really no polyatomic ions in this one. Uh, so we're going to take our normal approach of a little table, reactants, products. We got a little carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Once again, on the left-hand side there, that is four carbons. Right-hand side, one. Left-hand side, 10 hydrogens. Right-hand side, two. Left-hand side, two oxygens. Right-hand side, two oxygens there. Plus one more there makes three. All right, so not much balance. Once again, gonna start with really what appears to be the easiest to balance, and that's gonna be carbon in my case. Uh, I'm gonna put a four there. Once again, this is gonna get distributed to everybody behind. So that's gonna give me now four carbons. Uh, we will still have uh, two hydrogens there. Oxygens, we have four times two, which is eight. And we have one more there. And that gives us to nine oxygens in this case. Now, once again, in this case, hydrogen looks like a winning place to go next because again, it's only in one place on each side of the arrow. Oxygen's in multiple places. So frankly, that's gonna make a mess too early for us. So we're gonna go with hydrogen. And we got 10 on the left, uh, two on the right. Means pretty easily we could fix that by putting a five in there. Once again, only coefficients, giving us four carbons. Hydrogens now is five times two, which is 10. And oxygens, we still have four times two, which is eight. But now we have five times one, which turns this into a five. That's a lot of math, but I grabbed the calculator. That's an eight and a five. We'll go with lucky number 13 in this case. So now we pretty much locked up the right-hand side of the arrows. And all we have left to work with in terms of oxygen is the left-hand side. So I need 13. And I have only two on the left. Once again, we don't want to really touch anything here because that's going to mess up everything. So we do want to focus in on the guy on the left there. And this is a place where we got to turn like a two into a 13. This is screaming fraction, hopefully, at you. Once again, the fraction is very easy to figure out. I need a 13. So that is what should go up on top is what I need. And what should go on the bottom should be this number to match. So that's going to be a 13 over 2 in this case. So here, that's going to give us uh, four carbons, uh, still 10 hydrogens. Once again, we take 13 over 2 times 2, which is basically multiplying these guys together. Twos cancel gives us 13. So that gives us 13. Once again, this is balance, but maybe not a full happy face because 
as we've talked about, we cannot leave it like this. So although it is balanced, although we could use the fraction like we talked about, once again, we do need to clear the fraction. So not too bad here. We're going to multiply everybody by the denominator, which means in this case, we're going to do a two times everybody. That's going to yield us a 2C4H10 plus 13 halves times 2 is 13O2. Going to 4 times 2, which is 8CO2. And lastly, 2 times 5 is 10 waters. And now we should have all whole numbers, simplest set of whole numbers. And once again, it should still be balanced. One last check here. 2 times 4 is 8 for the carbon on the left. 8 times 1 is 8 on the right. Hydrogen 2 times 10 is 20. On the right, 10 times 2 is 20. Like a right 20. There we go. And lastly, here, oxygen is 13 times 2. Who is a lot? 26, I think. All right. And this guy, we got 8 times 2, which is 16. And this guy, we got 10. And I believe that's a 26. So we are balanced. We have all whole numbers. Once again, our fraction is something that we could use uh, to benefit us here. So clearly, you need to be able to write equations. Uh, you need to be able to balance equations. Uh, again, sometimes you may have to use a fraction. Sometimes you've got some polyatomic ions happening there. Once again, you should always make sure the equation is balanced. Uh, even if it doesn't tell you to balance the equation, take a look at it, balance it. Pretty much everything that you do with the equation, which again, in the next chapter, we'll talk about calculations, always involves a balanced equation. So you want to make sure it is always balanced. All right. Well, I think this is a good stopping point here for part one of this chapter. I'm going to go with chapter eight. We're on, I hope. Uh, if not, just pretend. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, part one of chapter eight here. That means part two of chapter eight is coming up and part two of chapter eight. We will actually now get into different ways to classify reactions uh, and different types of reactions. So for now, we are balancing professionals. Enjoy that and have a good one. And we will see you on part two of chapter eight. Have a good one. Bye bye. Hello there. And welcome to the end here of this chapter. Ah, I've told a lot of chemistry jokes up to this point. I'm almost out of chemistry jokes. Perhaps I should zinc of a new one. <laughs>